Hello again and welcome back. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen me yet today, I'm Eric Schumacher Rasmussen. I'm the VP and Editor-in-Chief of Streaming Media Magazine and the Chair of Streaming Media West. And we're going to be spending the next 45 minutes or so talking about Generation Alpha. That's right. And how to reach them with David Williams from Pocket Watch. Hey, everybody. Welcome, David. Um, for those who don't know, Generation Alpha is essentially defined as people who were born in 2010 or later, right? Yep. So post iPad. So they've grown up knowing nothing but a world in which they could watch content on their iPad, in which YouTube was pervasive. We had a conversation earlier today with Awesomeness about what it's like to reach Generation Z. Uh, I've got two kids, one in each generation, and they couldn't be more different in the way they consume content. Um, so I'm looking forward to learning more about how Pocket Watch reaches Generation Alpha and what, every, what we can all learn from that in this room. So, David, for those who don't know, can you tell our uh, audience what Pocket Watch is, how it came to be, and at, where it's at today? You got it, absolutely. Well, I mean, I think it's, uh, it's a really exciting time to be in this business because um, what we saw was a dramatic shift in kid audiences. Uh, from you know the year 2015 on, in fact, television viewership fell 65 percent from 2010 to 2017 in terms of kid uh, kid television. Um, at the same time, device usage among kids went from three percent to 45 percent, which is crazy dramatic. And this left a really interesting uh, couple of holes in the market in that. A, if you were interested in um, selling something to these kids, all your traditional paths weren't really going to be working anymore. So if you want to sell toys or you want to sell toothbrushes or whatever you want to sell, if you're trying to advertise it on television, expecting similar results that you had in the previous decade, probably not going to happen. And even more importantly, what we saw was with kids, they've got this incredible enthusiasm for these native creators on platforms like YouTube. And we saw the audience shift had really moved to YouTube. It was really one of the big beneficiaries of this shift. In fact, we saw that over half of the views on YouTube among the top 100 channels were actually on kids' content. So here you've got these kids consuming this content on small portable devices, on phones and whatnot, and yet when they put the device down, these stars from YouTube or characters are nowhere else in their lives, right? And this is a great contrast from the way it worked in traditional media where, you know, if you love Paw Patrol on TV and you go out into the world, there's Paw Patrol everywhere or SpongeBob everywhere. So we really thought it was time to kind of bring some of these favorite properties, these characters and, and personalities to the rest of kids' lives, right? They, this is what they want. In fact, their enthusiasm for these native characters and personalities exceeds their enthusiasm for what they had on television. So what we'd like to say about Pocket Watch is we create global multi-platform franchises from the characters and stars that Generation Alpha loves today. And you know, sometimes I like to say that we're a little bit like Marvel. We're a little bit like Marvel, but YouTube is our comic books. Mm -hmm. So we see these incredible fan bases gravitate to YouTube, and then, um, and we can do a nice business, kind of incubating and super serving them there. But then, lots of business outside of it. So Ryan of Ryan's World uh, is we like to call him the most popular kid in the world ever. And he's the one who does a billion views a month on YouTube. And we actually crunch the numbers on his uniques. And if you actually look at his uniques, he's doing 84 million domestic uniques uh, as of the last quarter. So in Q3, he did 84 million domestic uniques. If you look at Disney Channel and Nickelodeon, they're in the 60s and 70s by Nielsen. So one channel of, of Ryan's alone would be by far the number one kid's cable channel in the world if it was on cable. Um, and so we, d we partnered with Ryan and we developed a full partnership um, that includes product line, toys. Um, we've got everything we like to say from toys to toothbrushes. Mm -hmm. We recently launched a, a console game called Race with Ryan on Switch and PlayStation, Xbox. 
we did a TV show with him, and we see TV shows as just another hub on the wheel, just uh -huh. another spoke on the wheel. Um, it's called Ryan's Mystery Playdate. It's on Nickelodeon, and surprise, surprise, it's the number one show for preschoolers in the country. Um, we've taken it to, to UK and Australia. It's the number one show on Nickelodeon in those territories. Um, so the popularity really translates. The demand among the kids is voracious and there, and, um, and that's just the beginning. So uh, you said that in some ways, if, if you're like Marvel, then YouTube is your comic book, right? Yep. Um, why do you think it is that kids, you know, you, may, you also mentioned that, that kids are more enthusiastic about these stars, these characters, and I thought it was interesting you called them characters too, because... Well, some of them are, are right? some of them are. Right. Um, why do you think their enthusiasm for these stars and characters that they meet on YouTube is even greater than they have for the, the ones that are native to Nickelodeon or native to Disney Channel? You know, it's a, it's a great question, and I, I think... You know, a lot of us ponder it, and this, you know, I'm sure a lot of us have ideas about it. Um, I really believe that this is, this is really an amazing revolution in that with the democratization of video, mm -hmm. for the first time in history, we basically have kids making or participating in the making of their own content. Right. It's kind of insane. And this is content that no, you know, we like to say no grown up would ever, you know, come up with this stuff. And I think there is something to that, you know, it's such an abused word, but that authenticity mm -hmm. that comes across. And even more importantly, I think in that, the context of that authenticity of sort of kids and families making their own content, there is a connection with these kids that happens that is much more akin to a friendship. It feels like part of a social network. Um, even though kids wouldn't use that terminology, mm -hmm. than it does um, a media property, you know, that kind of comes down from the mountain. And I think that kind of like, you know, the kids think of Ryan as, his, as their friend. Right. And they, they develop what feels, I think, like a, friend, a friendly, intimate relationship with him and the other stars, Evan Tube, Hobby Kid, the others that we work with and many others on the platforms. I think that's a big part of it. Right, right. And in general, when, when talking about trying to create content that connects with, uh, with kids who are nine years old and younger, can you talk about what some of the opportunities are and what some of the challenges are as well? Well, I think, you know, the opportunities are, are numerous. And sometimes I like to define our business model as kind of a franchise model. And I think it's really interesting when I look out into the, the landscape today of, of streaming video and content producers, I think what you see more and more is a sort of um, emphasis on content as the kind of activation for an ecosystem. Um, obviously, you see this mm -hmm. with Disney. Um, I think you know some of the stuff that Nickelodeon is doing, you see it with um, even like HBO Max is part of an AT&T ecosystem, Apple Plus. So um, the opportunities are to kind of activate these incredibly broad uh, and rich ecosystems of product and consumer experiences uh, with kids. And I think kids actually have a more voracious appetite for these kind of ecosystems than even grown-ups. I mean, you know, building a... I, there's there's a stat that I'm going to mangle that something like it's something like half of all licensed merchandise is sold to kids 17 and under. Mm -hmm. So, I, like I said, I probably mangled sure. that, but you get the point. That if you think about the world of of licensed merchandise, especially which can be such a a, a great component of the business model, kids are really the heart of it. And so that, that to me is part of what the opportunity looks like. Also, you know, to build brands that are gonna resonate with kids and be a part of their lives in a meaningful way forever. You know, that's, that's a kind of really exciting, juicy opportunity. Um, on the challenges side of the equation, uh, you know, they're almost commensurate. <laughs> right. Um, this is the most cluttered and sort of habitually low commitment media environment 
that you could ever possibly imagine, mm -hmm. right? I mean, you've seen your kids right. on the iPad, and if something is not holding their attention for even a moment, you know, they're only one, one tap deep, and they're one tap from something else. And I think crafting content that is going to first break through that clutter to hook an audience in the mm -hmm. first place is an immense challenge. And then hold them and create loyalty and enthusiasm from there is a huge part of the challenge because you lose, you know, you, you go soft for a second and they're gone. Um, so figuring out strategies to combat that clutter and low commitment, I think, is one of the sort of highest hills to climb. Okay. And, you know, our, our go-to number one strategy is to partner with the geniuses who are <laughs> the eight-year-old kids. Right, right, right. <laughs> who have made it all work. Right. Um, we were talking last week as we prepped for this conversation about how, you know, historically, kids' television has been very highly segmented from the rest of the television world. It used to be Saturday morning and then after school and then that was it. And it was also very, very clearly delineated that this is a show for little kids, preschoolers. This is a show for elementary schoolers. Um, we were talking just a moment ago though about how that's not actually how kids watch TV, right? I've got a 10 year old and he loves Marvel. He loves Fortnite. But every once in a while, I still catch him watching an old episode of Bubble Guppies or, uh, you know, something, <laughs> something a little kiddish, you know, not when his friends are around, but, um, yeah. so, and again, I guess, you know, not to, not to say opportunities and challenges again, but I imagine that brings with it both opportunities and challenges. How do you and your creators negotiate that world where things aren't so clearly defined? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think that it's funny. It's something creators sort of do by themselves, they sort of do it instinctively. And, and one of the things is that there tend to be fewer markers of what age group co this, this content is intended for. Mm -hmm. So um, as you mentioned, in the past, it's, you know, kids' content is relegated to a kid's channel or it's relegated to a kid's block and it's sort of really packaged in a way that's very much like this is just for kids or this is just for, you know, under five and this one is for 10-year-olds. And I think, you know, what we've kind of learned on digital platforms is kids are spontaneously improvising their own media diets from mm -hmm. this kind of endless buffet where nothing, you know, for better or for worse, nothing really has age demarcations right. on it. And, um, and I, think that's, I, I think that's really exciting. And you've got kids, you know, who certainly will consume above their age group in a, in a nutritious way and kids who will dip down for the comfort of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, from our standpoint, I always say that we, we need to be very cautious about what we're signaling to the audience about who this content in, is intended for. Some of the most successful content that we see on the platforms is content that you might think doesn't look like it's for young kids. In fact, when I was at Maker, I was at Maker Studios, the big YouTube MCN before Pocket Watch, um, you know, people would come with ideas for maybe marketing campaigns or for shows. And I would always say, stop right there. Take the audience you think you're reaching and subtract seven. Because nobody understood at the time just how young the YouTube audiences mm -hmm. were. And we see content, for instance, there's, there's a channel uh, that, that I love and, and we kind of are, are you know, working on, on different ways of working with um, uh, Chad Wild Clay. And he does these, these big adventures. Um, it's, it's kind of a Mr. Robot for kids. It's like there's a hacker, there's all this drama, there's like action and fights. And if you were to look at it, you'd probably say, oh, it's for teenagers. It's for eight-year-olds. Like, it's the eight-year-olds really? who, who are loving this stuff. And, uh, you know, uh, it's not a huge surprise necessarily when you think about our current just state of entertainment. Right. Look at, you know, look at Marvel and the Avengers. You know, there are, there are eight-year-olds who love that stuff too, even though there's stuff in there that's really meant for a more grown-up audience. Right. What about sort of going the, the other direction, or I guess it's... Uh, Again, that's an opportunity. You can reach kids of all ages with your content. Um, most of the content that comes out of Pocket Watch, I mean, there's nothing there that's going to raise any moral or ethical issues, but, you know, or as we parents like to say, appropriate, right? Right. Is, but, you know, are there, are there those discussions that go on 
about you know how far you want to push certain boundaries. Uh, awesomeness when they were up here today talked about you know their motto is sort of be real, be kind, and be honest. Um, and you can be real and you can be honest and still be kind. You can still sort of keep in mind that these are kids and they needed to be acknowledged as kids even as you're not talking down to them. Are there ever any things that come up where you say, no, we really, we really can't do that for, for uh, uh, a property, a character that's really you know, mostly seven to 10 year olds? You know, not, not too much, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Um, a lot of our content we, we create in partnership or it has actually been created by our, our creator partners. In fact, I noticed in the description, I feel like it might give Pocket Watch a little too much glory on some of the content. We produce original content as a studio with our creator partners, mm -hmm. and that's definitely a big part of our business. The Rides Mystery Playdate, is a great example of that. We have another one called Hobby Kids Adventures. It's an animated show created by, or co-created by Butch Hartman, who did Fairly Odd Parents, a very well-known kind of in the Nickelodeon uh, world. But a lot of the content that we distribute is the content that they made for their YouTube channels. And, um, and we repackage it, we kind of plus it up a little bit, we add some wraparounds and things like that. We, we, we make sure it's cleared and scrubbed of any sort of elements that might be a problem, but those typically aren't mm -hmm. the kind of like standards and practices <laughs> problems and practices, that right. you, you might think. And I think it's, it has to do with the instincts of those families mm -hmm. that they, they understand you know, that they've got their kids in the room. I think they, they tend to make pretty good decisions on that front, but we do have our own set of, of S&P guidelines. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are things like, you know, the things that are on the bubble are things like implied profanity, right? Like, right. Like, shut the F up. If I right. said that, like, where does, where does that fall? And mm -hmm. is that okay for a nine-year-old maybe, but not, not so okay for a six-year-old? But they're pretty marginal. Okay. All right. Um, so so, sometimes it's stuff like Fortnite. It's like when they're playing Fortnite, that becomes a bigger question for us because that's, we consider that sort of a, a little bit of a 10 year old and right. type property, but kids love it. And yep. so you've got to find a little bit of a balance there. Right, right. So I just, I just got to ask, what's it like working with these kids? <laughs> and what's it like working with their parents, I guess, too, as well? Yeah, um, I mean, look, First of all, we're really lucky and, I mean, we, we worked really hard to find good partners and we have a very diligent vetting process and to make sure we have shared values as, long, as well as business goals and, and whatnot, and I think that, that helps. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's generally great. That said, uh, you know, sometimes when we talk about Ryan's world as an example, we talk about how, how Pocket Watch is a little bit like the Disney to their Pixar. Right, like our greatest strengths, honestly, are probably around the machine part of franchise building. Mm -hmm. um, we we love our Ryan's Mystery Playdate show, and you know we we think Albie Hecht, who came from Nickelodeon, was the president of Nickelodeon for SpongeBob and Kids Choice, and Dora is a genius and is doing great work. Um, but you know uh, this content is is coming is coming from the kids. Um, and uh, and what, was, what was the question again? What's it like working with these kids? Oh, what's it like and working their, with their parents? Them? Yeah, and so, um, so when they come to the table, you know, they're kind of primed to, to work with us in a really positive way. Mm -hmm. And um, we, you know, try to give them a lot of, a lot of, a lot of leash and, uh, and just try to give them some broad direction. Okay. Um, but I will say that uh, YouTube creators have an incredible sense of entrepreneurial spirit mm -hmm. and independence, and they've pulled themselves up by the bootstraps and they've done it themselves. And, um, you know, that is something that it takes some effort to learn how to collaborate with, to be honest, right? right. Like they've done everything themselves. They've done it in, in a trench in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. right? They've been in, a, in, a, in their own groove. They haven't poked their head up. They don't really know what, how the rest of the entertainment business works. And so there's just a lot of, of discussions around like what the dynamics of, of this industry are, how this works, you know, what the runways look like. And these are often very foreign to, you know, people who've made their empires from their living rooms. Right, right. Uh, another thing we were talking about last week as we prepared was how um, YouTube and, you know, what still sometimes gets called user-generated content um, is still sort of treated as, as inferior to 
the Disney Plus, the, the blockbuster Marvel, Star Wars, Netflix content. Um, you know, even at a conference like this, perhaps especially at a conference like this, when you know, you've got HBO Max talking, you've got Amazon Prime. Um, however, you just shared those numbers earlier for the kind of views that Ryan gets. Your other properties don't get quite those views, but they get views that I think, frankly, would be really surprising to a lot of people. I, I, and I so, do doubt it. So there's, there's the question of treating this, this content um, with the same seriousness from a business standpoint, but also the content itself is somehow and still sometimes seen as inferior to professionally produced Hollywood content. Do you think that's changing? Slowly. Okay. Um, I think we all come to new content forms with, uh, you know, a, a foundation of content experiences that we sort of judge them against. Mm -hmm. And I think you see that kind of generation after generation. I've made the, you know, the analog to, to comic books. Well, comic books were thought of as trash for you know, decades, and now you, know, you can't put a movie into theaters unless it came mm -hmm. from a comic book. Um, similarly, you know, I think hip hop is probably the greatest example of this, where um, it's content that people really look down on. It was democratically created um, you know, by people without help from big studios right. and producers, uh, and somehow it was inferior. And, and now we look at it today, and it's truly high art. It is the music art form of our time. And um, I think in a lot of ways that the content that, that, that these creators are making, look, it, there's a spectrum. Some of it's good, some of it's less good, some of it's more good. Um, but I think it's still painted with a really broad brush and that brush is that it's, it's not as good as the stuff that you know, we made as, as, as an industry of seasoned professionals. Uh, and I think that that's honestly just short-sighted. I think that there's tremendous, like it's that intimacy, that authenticity, the realness, the relatableness of it. Um, and even the story construction, I don't people think people give it enough credit for overcoming those, those problems of clutter and mm -hmm. low commitment that I talked about before. Well, these people are masters of it. And, and you know, surprise, I think, as this industry continues to evolve, those problems of clutter and, and, and low commitment aren't gonna get easier right, for right, anybody. Right. And so those skills and that craft of being able to understand how to break through and retain audiences is, is gonna be greater than ever. So I think that it's, they're unfairly maligned. I think that there also uh, are some presumptions about what's good for kids that I just, I, I'm skeptical about. I just, if the kids love I, there's no way to overstate how much the kids love these creators, how much they love Ryan. I mean, we had Dave Grohl from the Foo Fighters mm. on Ryan's Mystery Playdate. Really? Yeah. And it was, you know, all of the olds here were pretty <laughs> excited about it. Um, you know, his daughter has met a you know, the Beatles, <laughs> she's, right. you know, she's been around roy rock royalty and Ryan was the ultimate, you know, sort of fan experience for her. Um, so there's really no way to kind of overstate how passionate the kids are. So to go in and then sort of, you know, kind of pop kids balloon and say your content that you love is somehow inferior and not good. I just find it very presumptuous. Who knows what kids at this age are really needing developmentally? And who's to say that these models that they're seeing in this programming of, of happy families and, you know, how these happy families socialize and experience things, that this is somehow trash. Um, so I, I think this content hasn't really seen its, its light of day in terms of the, the respect that it, it frankly deserves. Okay, so, so even though, for instance, you know, Ryan now has a series on Nickelodeon, um, you don't look at that as necessarily, you know, that content stepping into something more respectable, right? Or better. Well, Different. It's different, and it's from, different. A, from a yeah. business standpoint. I mean, let's be honest. Who are our business to business partners? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, they're they're older people, and so they've got really fond thoughts about Nickelodeon. That's what they grew up with. And right. So to have that kind of success 
with a brand like Nickelodeon in a, in a traditional medium that our business partners and our business prospects grew up with, it's amazing for business. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, whether that content has more merit than the content on Ryan's channels, I don't think so. I think it's apples to oranges. Right, right. Uh, are we going to see more expansion, do you think, of, of YouTubers of all ages, but particularly uh, those creating kids' content sort of expanding beyond the YouTube universe to Nickelodeon, to Hulu, to other uh, outlets, traditional OTT outlets rather than YouTube? Well, that's a, a, nice, a nice opening for me to plug the fact that we just launched our Pocket Watch channel, which is a 24-7 live streaming channel on uh, Pluto today. Oh, great. Um, so we're very happy about that. Um, we had launched the same channel uh, with the Roku channel as part of their kids and family package um, back in August, and we'll be expanding it, and we'll be actually doing additional channels moving forward. We, we believe a lot in that, that part of the ecosystem. I think there's a lot of excitement in that part of the ecosystem. Um, and, um, you know, I think what's happening on YouTube, frankly, is continues to be highly dynamic, shall we say. Um, there's been um, some, some big changes and some big changes coming. Uh, the FTC, I'm not sure how many are aware, uh, had a big settlement with Google not long ago for, for how it complies with what's known as COPPA, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. And as part of that settlement, there's gonna be big changes to YouTube. And, and the bottom line is it's probably going to be much more difficult for, and I, I find this a little bit sad, but that for, for grassroots creators mm -hmm. in the kids space to succeed. Um, I think people who are established will succeed and continue to succeed, but to kind of break in and, and to sort of have the opportunity that they may have had a year or two ago, uh, it's, it's a different kind of opportunity and it's gonna be tougher. And all of that, I think, you know, adds to this drive to diversify and adds to this notion of kind of um, building franchise and building mm -hmm. consumer experiences outside of, of, of a single platform. And so where a creator maybe was putting 100% of their energies into YouTube, I think now they will look to companies like Pocket Watch to help them come out to Pluto and Roku and Samsung and the other, you know, major uh, streaming players. Uh, as well as Hulu and you know even classical television. Right now, as as these creators get older, right, they're going to move from YouTube, I would think, to other platforms that are not available. Well, a lot of us have kids who are under 13 who really want to be on Snapchat or TikTok <laughs> or Instagram, right? Um, and a lot of kids under 13 are. But as these creators grow older, are you looking forward and looking ahead to okay, how can we help? And, or work with Ryan, for instance, just as an example, yeah. or Evan, to grow and maybe start seeing Instagram as an outlet or Snapchat? Yeah, I, we're, we're approaching that in a lot of different ways. Um, first of all, you know, TikTok, we think, is actually a really exciting platform in the kids' space. Um, it's been growing like mad. It, I think it offers a little bit of that democratic opportunity that maybe uh, is, is going to be um, declining a little bit over at YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, it's immensely creative. So we, we think that there's a big opportunity on, on TikTok. We think these things kind of live in harmony, frankly. Like, right. Sometimes we've used a clock metaphor to discuss content strategy where things like TikTok and Instagram are a second hand in terms of being very high frequency, uh, kind of low stakes content. And then you move up to a YouTube as your minute hand where there's actually a library of content that you can create on YouTube and the library will keep on giving. It doesn't matter if it's you know a week old or a month old or a year old or even a few years old. Um, that catalog keeps on giving. And then you've got kind of the, the hour hand which would be sort of features and other big high premium content. So we think it's really important for it all to work together. And we think that it's really important for creators to explore other avenues. Evan Tube is now 14. Okay. He's a little bit of the OG in the in the <laughs> unboxing space. He was doing it, I think, since he was like seven or seven, something. Seven, yeah, I think. Um, and now he's 14, and he's really into streaming. So he's got a Twitch channel, you know. And so we're we're helping to to uh, to to cultivate him there. But we also want to make sure that we can allow uh, these kids to kind of grow up and, and do what they want to do. They have different kinds of aspirations. And we take very seriously their well-being. I think, 
you know, we, we talk a lot about the, the work-life balance and making sure they're putting away for their future and the importance of education and really making sure that they don't feel locked into a path at this young age mm -hmm. is really important. So one of the things we do is a lot of animation. Mm -hmm. So we develop things like, you know, the Hobby Kids Adventures, and we've got another one coming, coming out called uh, Onyx Monster Mysteries, and we do a lot of animation with Ryan. And what's beautiful about animation is that it can kind of, it's evergreen, you yeah. know, it sort of lives forever, and, uh, and, and you don't have to kind of keep refreshing it. Right, right. Well, I'd like to take some questions from the audience now. If people do have questions, I'll come around with the, with the handheld. Hello. Hello. So my question has to do with the balance of the nag factor of the kids driving what they want, um, but also with the gatekeeper of parent, particularly with licensing. The kids aren't going to be doing the actual purchasing, right? It has to pretty much be mom and dad or you get yeah. slapped for marketing to kids under 17 online. So how do you balance that parent approved factor with not wanting to be diminishing the, the kid's voice? That's a really great question. I mean, I think uh, there's, there's a few different, first of all, we're figuring it out. It's, it's new territory. We, we don't have all the answers. We do a lot of talking to parents um, on Facebook. You know, we think that there's definitely a very strong parent contingent there. So we, we do marketing and we do content on Facebook knowing that there's kind of a parent view. Um, we haven't done this yet, but we, we, we're very eager to engage in a conversation with parents about a lot of the topics that I think are on their minds about sort of balance in their own lives and you know, how do you balance? We, we like to say that we inspire a cycle of screen time to play time and back again. And you know, we see that happen uh, all over the place. Like I think if you have kids at home, it's not uncommon you know, when the screen goes off, they kind of want to go do what they just saw on the screen and we want to go and cultivate those conversations and, and places like Facebook are a good way to do it. Um, but truthfully, um, you know, you probably don't want to hear this, but we want the kids to nag their parents. <laughs> and so we, we, we do things that help create desire among the kids for, for, it doesn't take much. You know, Ryan plays with one of Ryan's toys. Ryan brushes his teeth with his Colgate toothbrush, which by the way, is like the greatest selling, the, big, the, the, the best selling uh, oral, care line, oral care line they've done. Um, kids are inspired. They want to go do that themselves. And then we reinforce it with other marketing and other conversations across platforms. So we're doing both and we're learning and trying to figure it out. If you have any advice, I'm certainly open to it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> other questions for David? Yeah. As some of these uh, characters move into the streaming, the live streaming area, uh, have you done any brand uh, like collaborations with these characters and how do you uh, prevent a seven year old from saying something <laughs> that you don't want them to say about a brand or something like that in, huh. <laughs> in this kind of environment? When you say brand collaborations, I think you mean kind of what, yeah, what we, we call brand integrations or branded entertainment, right? Um, you know, it's hard. And so, first of all, we don't do it, we, we vet it all very carefully. So we don't, if the, the creator doesn't want to do it, if the creator feels like it's not in line with their honest feelings, we're not going to do it. And that's, that's the truth. Um, and then beyond that, it's definitely a friction point where a marketer from a brand wants a certain story told in a certain way about a product. And, um, and I think this is a little bit of like the age old friction in the brand integration space, honestly. Um, and we, we sort of have to step in and say, trust the creator. You know, we'll, we'll take the big, the big picture points, um, but trust the creator. And then, you know, if something is, needs to get massaged in editing, we can do that. But sticking, like giving a, giving a kid like Ryan or Evan a script and asking them to sort of do the script or even like do the points on the script, 
as soon as they're not having fun with the video, we've got problems. You know what I mean? So we really want to set up an environment where they're having fun. That's why they're doing it. Like in all the cases that we've dealt with, like the reason these families are doing it has a lot to do with the kids wanting to do it and asking to do it and having fun doing it. And so that's a, that's a big part of it. And so if it means you know, turning away business sometimes or, or really pushing back, that's what we have to do. All right, any other questions? Yes. If, um, can you talk a little bit about franchising and particularly in two different points, the development of content, like how you approach it, especially when you are maybe working with a new brand, how you kind of think about your universe as Pocket Watch, and then also kind of like licensing and how that plays into you, how you perceive franchising. Sure. Um, I will say that there's no, um, you know, we, we have yet to kind of have the formula that we can carve into stone and bring down from the mountain. It is very much a boutique, handcrafted situation. And, and to be quite candid, like we have already learned from some mistakes. Um, and so, first of all, it starts with the um, match of the creator and their aspirations, and then a, some kind of collective inspiration around content. So a good example is, is Hobby Kids, great family, great fan base, like 80 million views a month. Um, they love playing with toys, they love doing adventures and stuff like that. And so we, we had to make sure that what they were interested in was creating a, a franchise that's like starts with content. We, you know, it's really important to us to be content first. Um, and then married them with this concept where they get transformed into animals <laughs> and have ad adventures as kind of these, these anthropomorphized, or what's the opposite of anthropomorphize actually? The animal promorphize of themselves. And then we brought in Butch Hartman, who's this great creator I mentioned before, and had a meeting of the minds. And so it's all of that kind of like prep work at the beginning to make sure goals are right, sensibilities are right, we're all collectively inspired around the story world and then developing that story world. And then, and this is where I think we, we've, we've learned some things, we went out to, um, we went out to uh, merchandisers uh, and, and licensees right away. Uh, you know, we said, hey, you know, we had this huge success with Ryan, we're gonna go do it again with Hobby Kids, and we um, really worked closely with them to get products, toys specifically, that everyone was really inspired by, and we did that. And um, we launched the toy line almost at the same time that we actually launched the show, and we launched the show on the Hobby Kids YouTube channel. Um, and almost completely organically, we just kind of work with them a bit on, on preparing their channel for this launch with kind of some preparatory content that was really designed to sort of get their audience ready and build enthusiasm. And so that part of it was great, and we, we've done something like 70 million views on this franchise since it launched back in, I'm gonna say August, somewhere around there, which is way beyond of our, our, our sort of uh, benchmarks. Um, but the toy line has been disappointing. And, you know, and so it makes us take a step back and say, well, did we do it the right way? Maybe next time we need to build in more runway with the content so that we can kind of see which characters and which kind of storylines the audience. I mean, one of the great things about these platforms is you get such incredible feedback in terms of what the audience likes and doesn't like. So maybe we should kind of stretch out the runway and we'll learn more next time about what they love before we kind of go really aggressive with a big product line. Maybe we'll start with a small product line, things like that. So. Um, it's, but we're also taking that show to premium platforms. It's on Hulu, uh, for example. So Hulu really liked that show and they bought it. Um, and so it does well on the content front, but we, you know, we missed a little bit on the, on the products. And that's, uh, you know, it's, we, we're really excited that we can be at the forefront of this and kind of learn you know, these, these, the best practices as we go um, because it's a lot of new terrain. But you know, we don't have all the answers yet. We're just, uh, we're just figuring it out. All right, any other questions for David? Well, wonderful, thank you so much, David. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, everybody.